This is going to be a study on the scariest things God can do to a man. And number one, God can leave them alone. Romans 1, 26 through 28 says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I don't believe the people mentioned in these verses are without hope. But when a person continues in vile sin and these vile affections, God will eventually give them over to a reprobate mind. And this doesn't mean the person can't be restored and be saved. And it doesn't mean they can't be saved if they realize their guilt of sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. These people can get so far off into sin that they give themselves over to that sin. You can give yourself over to fornication and drunkenness. But people love sodomy. They love their sin so much that they can't see their life any other way. And they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They want to be their own final authority and do what they want to do. And I'm glad that God bothers me about any sin that pops up in my life. Immediately after I sin, the Holy Ghost says, You shouldn't have done that. And actually it happens while you're sinning that you'll hear that voice that's telling you, don't do this, it's wrong, it's a sin. You remember the Bible says this, that's wrong. And it's a scary time when a person's conscience gets seared and they can sin more frequently without God saying, hey, don't do that, that's wrong. And this leads a people and a nation down a path of destruction when men sin without resistance they won't get right. They'll continue to sin. But another thing that's scary that God can do to a person is let them be turned over to Satan. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a saved man is turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 says, To deliver such an one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He was committing fornication with his father's wife. So if a Christian stays in his sin, he won't lose his salvation, but he can be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And maybe you have a besetting sin that you're having trouble getting the victory over. The best thing you can do is get in the Bible, get on your knees, and stop giving the flesh what it wants. Getting outdoors and getting involved in hard physical labor will help you keep the flesh under control. A hard physical job mixed with listening to hard preaching and Bible reading will do wonders for a Christian and help a Christian get rid of the sin in his life. A person who works hard isn't going to have as much time to sin and when he gets off work he will be too tired to sin. But if you stay in that sin, God is liable to let the devil get a hold of you and take away your health. And now God can also... Let the devil torment a Christian by giving them a thorn in the flesh, even if the Christian didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes this just happens. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and God gives us a thorn to keep us humble, and because he gets the glory out of it. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, it says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So God can give somebody a thorn in the flesh, let them have a hard time in their life, just because it makes a person stronger when he becomes weak, he'll turn to God more. When you have a little strength, 
you'll come to God more than someone that has a lot of strength and doesn't have much trouble. But look at what Satan did to Job. He took everything he had. Don't stay in your sin and risk the devil taking everything you have. You can lose your health, your wealth, your testimony, and your sin affects other Christians. The Bible says no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. What you do affects other Christians. Evil communication corrupts good manners. And if you're telling dirty jokes, cussing, and being a blabbermouth gossip, then you're going to hurt other people. Satan is pretty much the rod of God. And he whips his people with the rod because he loves them. And the same reason a father would whip his child, this is the same reason God whips us. If you look at Hebrews 12, 7 and 8, it says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And why does he chasten you? Revelation 3.19 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. A father who doesn't correct his kid is an unfit parent. It's child abuse to let your kid do whatever he wants to do. It's child abuse to let your kid watch wicked music, listen to wicked music, watch all these bad TV shows, hang out with bad people. You're paving the way for them to go to hell. You're letting them do what they want while they don't have sense to know what is best for them. And that is why God gives us parents is so that they can guide us. Most parents these days never grew up. And they still act like the teenagers that they have. They listen to the same music and watch the same shows that their kids watch. And this isn't a loving parent. And God isn't like the parents you see today. God loves his children and that's why he chastens them. But another scary thing eh, that God can do is kill a person. Did you know that God will kill people for being wicked? Genesis 38, 7 says, And Ur, Judas' firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So he slew him because he was wicked. Some people are so wicked that God just gives a, goes ahead and kills him. And some Christians get so far off into sin that he has to take them out so they don't make a full of the Bible and the full of their church and everything else. Uh, you bring shame to his name when you claim to be a Christian and then you go out in front of atheists and all these God rejectors and then you act just like them and s sin openly. That brings shame to his name and gives them occasion to blaspheme his name. And the Bible talks about a sin unto death. Consider Herod who was killed because he didn't give God the glory. In Acts 12, 23, it says, And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Consider Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 5, 1, 2 through 3. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? They were both killed for this. Satan filled their heart, and you can be deceived by the devil, and think you're getting away with things when you're really not. And Christians many times think, well, God isn't doing anything to me, so I'm getting away with this sin. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Just because you're not getting chastened right away, or bad health right away, or getting everything taken away from you right away, is because God just hasn't chose to do it yet. And you need to realize that you're going to reap what you sow. The Bible says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You're going to reap what you sow. 
And God will take a Christian out who stays in unrepentant sin. But another scary thing that God can do to a man is blind him to the truth. And Second Thessalonians 2.11 says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. People in the time of Jacob's trouble are going to be sent a strong delusion. And they are going to believe the lies of the false prophet and the Antichrist. Men will have lying spirits in their mouth that will deceive people while they are being deceived themselves. 1 Kings 22.23 says, Now therefore behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. So it's the Lord that puts a lying spirit in the mouth of Rob Bell and Joel Osteen and Creflo Dollar and T.D. Jakes and all these fake money-hungry crooks. And they make all these action movies where the good guys will team up with the bad guy temporarily to get something accomplished. And that's just a stolen plot from the Bible because God is always using the devil and devils and wicked rulers to judge his people, chasing his people, and just to fulfill his will. Second Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's a judgment from God on a people. The more they reject the truth, the more blindness they're going to get. And you can be blinded to the truth. A Christian can correct God's book, and that's a sin. And he can correct it so much that God won't reveal anything to him anymore. The book of Romans chapter 1 talks about men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. If you're a Bible believer and you approach his book with a humble, believing, and sincere heart, then God will show you things. He will open your eyes. He'll take blinders off your eyes. And if you approach his book with the intent to correct it, to make people think you're smart, then you will be blinded to the book. Any man who approaches the Bible and says any of it shouldn't be there, or says a better rendering would be, or a better translation, or this word should really be this, that man is a liar. And the Bible says, let God be true, and every man a liar. When Schofield corrects the book in his reference Bible, he's a liar. When your grandmother corrects it, she's a liar. When your mother corrects it, she's a liar. If your wife corrects it, your preacher you corrects it, they're a liar. The book is right. It gets it right every time. And you're better off just taking what God says and taking that with faith, even if you don't believe it. Don't try to change it. And God lets Satan blind unbelievers to the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, four says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Satan is blinding the minds of unbelievers to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. False prophets and false teachers, the tongues movement, the mega churches, Joel Osteen, Rob Bell, Mark Driscoll, all them guys, and all these wicked men are the outcome of people rejecting the truth. Therefore, God is is letting lying spirits fill the mouth of all these false teachers. And he's letting them fill the mouth of every money-hungry TV evangelist that's telling you to send in $50 to get a free whatever he's given, which it's not free if you're given $50. But another thing scary that God can do to a person is laugh at their calamity. Proverbs one twenty four through 27 says, Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as a desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Imagine being at the great white throne judgment and hearing the almighty God who made the sun, the moon, and the stars, and everything that was made. Imagine hearing him laugh as you're cast into the lake of fire. God is a long-suffering God. He is a merciful God. 
He is a loving God, but men are so wicked that they don't understand how bad their sin actually is. They don't understand how much they have offended the holiest being in existence, and they think they are too good to go to hell. They are blinded to the filthy rags of their own self-righteousness, and God is drawing all men to be saved. But most men are presently rejecting the gospel, and the wrath of God is abiding on that person. They are on the broad way to hell. God is holy, just, and he won't let a sinner go to heaven no matter how much he loves them. Deuteronomy 28.63 says, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And you shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. What a scary verse. It said the Lord will rejoice to destroy you. If you reject the gospel, spit in the face of Jesus Christ and reject the gospel, then the Lord is going to rejoice to toss you into the lake of fire, and he will laugh. For thousands of years, man has mocked and made fun of God. Family Guy and every other satanic cartoon laughs at the Savior, but he who laughs last, laughs best. God sees all the wicked stuff going on. He sees the little babies being involved in sex traffic. He can see inside the trucks driving down the road full of kidnapped children who will be sex slaves to the wicked men who have given themselves over to their wicked desires. And God will rejoice and laugh at wicked men being tossed into the lake of fire. You think you're mad at sin. Imagine how much a holy God is mad at sin. And it's building up over thousands, the thousands of years that man has been here. That wrath is going to come out. And that brings us to our next point. It's going to be a scary thing to see Jesus Christ ride a horse in your direction. And this is going to be without any fear in his eyes. Isaiah 31, 4 says, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor a base for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Zion and for the hill thereof. At the second advent, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to charge all the God-haters without the slight of, slightest bit of fear in his eyes. He won't flinch when he tramples them under the feet of his supernatural white horse and slices them to pieces with a sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. Imagine being an enemy of God when he comes back at the second coming. And he won't be afraid of your guns or your tanks or your numbers that you have in your army. If you've read the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 men at once. You think he can't kill more than this? He could wipe out every person without even coming down to earth. But God isn't going to work that way. He's going to come down and fight. Revelation 1.14 says his eyes... Or as a flame of fire, and he will pierce through you with, eye, with his eyes that see right into your wicked soul. And he's going to come as the line of the tribe of Judah. He came as a lamb the first time. But then when he comes back, they're not going to crucify him this time. You're going to be killed because you're a God hater that's rejected the gospel. But I want to tell you how to be saved. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is this. Jesus died. He died for you. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Also look at that again. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Anyone who tries to lead a person to Jesus Christ without telling them they're a sinner, they're leaving out part of the gospel. That's in the gospel. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why do you think you need a Savior? Because you're a sinner. You can't get to heaven because your sins have separated you from God. And I'm not saying a person stops sinning to be saved or is going to be sinless. 
I'm saying that when you get saved, God takes away your unrighteousness and gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So after you get saved, God doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees the record of Jesus Christ. And if you want to be saved, you need to come to Jesus as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also says in Romans, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God will save any person that comes to Him as a guilty sinner, that knows they're going to hell, and that is sincerely wanting to be saved. God isn't going to turn His back on someone that's coming to Him wanting to be saved. You hear preachers that'll say, well, they send away their day of grace and they just they can't come to be saved now because they sin so much or they're rejected so much. If the person is desiring to be saved and they're willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then God is going to save that person. So come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior.